This is where the rubber really meets the road. Okay? If you're not going to capture your thoughts, if you're not going to get your thoughts lined up, nothing else is going to happen. It's got to start at the beginning. It all starts with an idea, with a thought. And that thought, it's got a, it's got a destiny attached to it, so you've got to be careful which thoughts you're going to hold on to and which ones you're going to you know, get rid of quickly. Because if you hold on to those thoughts, it's going to cause a problem. If you get rid of the thought quickly, you dismiss that thought, that thought can't do anything anymore. Very important. All right, so this is what we call the afterburn. So this is where we'll take questions from the congregation. If you're on live stream, you can type something in. Robert will make note of it. We do ask that you keep it to the subject matter covered today. And so, um, you know, and if, if it's anything that you bring up that I know I'm going to cover in part two or three or whatever, then I will... Uh, ask you to be patient until I can get to the next part. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to uh, bring out the fact that I, I picked up about three things out of what you were saying. Only three? You have to go back and let's do it again. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, that the major thing I th uh, found out was I've been uh, wrong all this time, but you know, we already knew that. Anyway, um, the, the first thought that I had was um, my actions are either seeking him or I'm forsaking him. There is no middle ground. Thank heaven it's also not a static situation. I can change it. Right. Um, number two, fighting with myself is a result of mixing good thoughts with evil thoughts. That's where being conflicted with myself comes from. Okay. And uh, related to Jeremiah 4.14, uh, washing of the water of the word, stay in his word, cleanse wicked thoughts out of the heart by dwelling on his word. Excellent. All right. And take those thoughts and ideas and meditate on them. And if they can bear some fruit, you'll be in good shape. Let that be a lesson to everyone. You know, we often get a good thought. In other words, a discernment of some sort. And we come to a good understanding of something. But the thing is, if we don't then take that thought and meditate on it and let it bear fruit, it wasn't that useful. Even though it occurred to you a light bulb went on, a, you know, you had this thought, but that thought has to then manifest. And the only way it manifests is if you keep it in front of your eyes. Maybe you want to write it down and keep it where you can see it to remind yourself. I want to see if I get this clear, but all, during the Exodus, when they were, I don't know how many people were sent out in the desert, in the wilderness. Two or three million. That many? Yep. Yeah. Any, six, one, any one of them yeah. could have turned around, repented, turned around, and came back if they did the Father's will. Am I right? Well, turn around and come back from where to go where? For, they were sent out in the desert because they weren't obedient. If, they, if any one of those wanted to be obedient, they could have came back. Am I correct? No, there was no place to come back to. He had already made a declare. All that they needed to do was just accept their punishment and do things right while they were in the 40 years. Because he had already declared that that first group was going to die in the desert. They did actually try to do that. The group that rebelled about going into the land decided to go back into the land after they rebelled against it. And Yahweh said, oh, no, no, no. Now you, you can't just go now and try and fix it after I already told you I've now rendered judgment. And so they ended up all dying the ones who tried to go back. The teshuvah they needed to do was to, like, like the same thing in Jeremiah. Jeremiah said to them, accept this punishment from Babylon. Go, and, and, but do your teshuvah there. Be obedient there. Learn your lesson there. In other words, accept your punishment, but know that you can learn while you're in your punishment. So you can do teshuvah, but there wasn't any place to go to get out of this punishment of the desert. He had already rendered judgment. See, once Yahweh renders judgment, there's no changing his judgment. Those who were in that generation were going to die in the desert. And they weren't getting out of the desert till that happened. However, those who were still going to live through the desert journey had a choice of how they were going to learn to deal with that punishment, to deal with that time in the desert. See, so you can make all the teshuvah you want. We're still in the exile. But that teshuvah that you're making is going to benefit you ultimately either in this life or the next based on whether or not he returns in this life or not. But you're making the changes internally while you're here 
dealing with the punishments, essentially. We're still in the punishment, the Deuteronomy 28, second half of the chapter. So yes, they could actually make a turning around, but it was internal. There was no place physical for them to turn around and go to. Okay, They were going to have to follow the pillar in the, in the desert and stay out there until the punishment was completed. The judgment had been rendered. Okay, so that's why you have to, you know, be careful. It's like when you say to a child, you know, well, you didn't do this, so I'm taking it away. Now they're going to run and do it, and they can only make it worse. You say, wait a minute, I already rendered my judgment. Now if I tell you not to do it, which is what Yahweh told them after they didn't go in, he says, well, I'm telling you, don't go in. You're going to die in the wilderness. Oh, no, no, we'd rather go in. We don't want to die in the wilderness. <laughs> Too late for that. I already rendered my judgment. What you can do is impress me in the wilderness so that we don't make this punishment go longer than it has to, and that, that, that others of you don't end up having to be punished. Does that make sense? Okay, next question. Okay, first question is from uh, Johnny. When I think and look at the fruit it will bring from, and my heart desires Abba, how can I know before I do something that it is a good thought? It could blow up and I'll believe me alone. Read that one more time. When I think and look at the fruit it will bring, and my heart desires Abba, how can I know before I do something that it is a good thought? It could blow up and I'll believe me alone. Okay, so the way... The, <laughs> There's two things that you can do. One is, when you have a thought, you match it up against the word and see if your thinking matches up with the word. The second thing you can do is, if you're not sure if it actually matches up with the word, is you seek counsel. That's your two options. Some things are pretty obvious because there's a direct thing in the word that deals with whatever it is that you are dealing with. Sometimes what you're dealing with is not directly covered by the word. It's indirectly covered by the word, and that's where you need counsel. I mean, let's say you're walking around the store and, you know, you see something that you could just grab and stick in your pocket and nobody's looking. Well, don't steal is in the word. The thought to steal is obvious. That's an obvious thing. There's a lot of things that are not so obvious. And that's where you would seek counsel. Okay, from uh, Sam Castro. Uh, so our thoughts are ultimately the chance for us to decide what slash who we will follow and in turn do before such an idea becomes a reality. Correct. From, um, I like when they keep going like that. He said yeah. stuff, you just keep saying <laughs> stuff, and I can just go, good, correct, that's good. From uh, Divsha. Uh, what about random thoughts that just pop in your hand? Is that Hasatan? Uh, okay. You're actually asking two things that I could cover. I'll, I'll cover them both. First of all, random thoughts, okay, are things that are still pieces of parts of you. Random thoughts are still, still little desires that are in you. Hasatan is not the initiator. If something randomly pops in your head, it's still a part of something inside of you that generated that thought. Now, that random thought may seem very random because it's not the, your usual thinking, since it's not a usual part of your thinking, it's an unusual thing for it to pop up, you can take that random thought and deal with it and, and, and then process it and get rid of it or, or decide to embrace it however you want. But realize, Hasatan does not initiate anything. If a thought pops in your head, he may have been there to help poke it into your head, but it still came out of something that's in you. That is still a part of you. That thought came out of you didn't come out of him. He didn't put the thought in you that something you would never would have thought. It may surprise you that that thought was in you, but it was in you. And by the way, it could be Yahweh allowing Hasatan to do that because he uses Hasatan to do these things so that you could realize that that thought is in you. A thought you maybe didn't realize was still a part of that inside part of you. Maybe it's something that you thought you'd already dealt with and then it pops up again. Something that hasn't popped up in a really long time. And you might be a Christian thought would be, oh, the devil's trying to mess with me. No. He's just bringing something out of you that was always there that you haven't completely gotten rid of. Now, let's see if you really got rid of it or not. It's a test. Now, if you have really gotten rid of it, the thought can go and right out. 
If you haven't really gotten rid of it, the thought stays. And now you're not sure what you want to do with it now that it's there. And so Hasatan may be being, he may be a part of that whole thing, but remember, the thought is yours. Okay? All thought that's, that's coming out like that is yours. The only one that's going to initiate anything is from the creator. Those thoughts he initiates. The things that you could never come up with, it has to come from him. The random thought, the random weird stuff that's like, well, I didn't know I'd want to do that or I'm interested in that. Or that's all you. It's in there. We all have got all kinds of tiny little pieces of yuck, of mess that's in there that needs to come out and get purged out. The thing is, it may be such a small percentage of who you are that it doesn't really come up very often, if even at all. And eventually it pops up. Because how many times have we seen or interacted with people and we thought we knew them and all of a sudden we find out they did something that you had no idea they were even capable of. You know what? They maybe not, had no idea they were capable of it either. And then the thought popped up. They didn't take it into captivity. And that, part of, that small part of their personality started to dominate. And they became something they didn't realize that was even in there. How many times have you had people talk about you know, how their child went away to school or they changed you know, physical location to another part of the country or they, they started living with different people or whatever it is and all of a sudden you don't even recognize them. It's like they're a different person. Their personalities change. Well, that personality still was a personality that was a part of the potential in them. Whatever it is, it was still something that they already had a part, it was a part of them. And it got to flourish in that environment where, where they were before, that piece didn't flourish. Which is, by the way, a good thing also. Because you may realize that there are certain things that are negative in your personality that can be fixed by getting yourself out of the place where that flourishes. Maybe the people you hang out with is creating an environment for that to flourish. I'm going to say something from a privately personal thing. You know, we had this challenge uh, even with my son. He started going to public school after we homeschooled him, and there were things that were flourishing we didn't like. We took him out, and almost all of it went away because it didn't have a place to flourish. Is it still there? Oh, yeah. That part of his personality is still there, just like all the young... Listen, every one of you has done some things you don't want to talk about. And that part of your personality is still there, but you have to have it under control. It has to be under your sovereignty where you no longer allow it to pop out. But it's still there. Just because you don't allow it to pop out doesn't mean it's eradicated and not possible. Put you in the right environment, you could be that person all over again. You know it. And so that's, that's real. So it's a good question that you asked uh, online because that hopefully clarifies some things for us. Everything that comes out of you or that dwells inside, has always been there, doesn't always get its opportunity to get attention. When it gets attention, though, then you get to decide what to do with it. If you're enough in control of yourself, where you can do that. Okay, that was mini-sermon number one. Go ahead, next question. That was some deep stuff there. <laughs> From uh, Tomas. Uh, can you explain Jeremiah 4.23... Is this not talking about the whole earth being empty at his second coming? And is this not a contradiction to Zechariah 14? Um, and he said that who's survivors? Um, That's okay. I don't need to get the full. I think it's that has survivors. Okay. Um, the purpose of this teaching was to see ourselves and the relevant points to ourselves in it, figuring out the full eschatology or the full timing of what he's talking about and where the metaphor is and where the literal is, is not part of what we're doing today. Okay, so I don't want to open up that whole thing and try to line all that stuff up. Just like literally when we were in First Chronicles, the temple was not going to literally be a footstool for Yahweh, even though he described it as one. Okay. And so we have to be aware that, yes, he's trying to get certain points to us across that will make sense in 
possibly multiple manifestations. In other words, it could have meant, made sense literally on how, do you know what Jerusalem looked like after Babylon came through? Probably looked exactly like it was described there. But can this also be talking about an end times event? Can it also be talking about the ultimate end time event when the whole earth is basically baptized in fire and we have a new heaven and a new earth? Could it be talking about all of these things in between? Could it be talking about the last war that ends all wars that will make the earth look like this? What could it be talking about? I don't know. All of them, maybe. But that's not the point of this teaching. Okay, so I appreciate your question, but that's, we have to, you know, let's remain focused on the point here is what was the cause of the problem? The problem was caused by wrong thinking by the nation of Israel. And as we know, it got pretty much laid waste when Babylon came in. Okay, next question. And there are no contradictions, so we have to, again, if we're actually lining things up, I know you said it seems to contradict Zechariah 14. There are no contradictions. It's just a matter of knowing what was for what, when was for when, what was referring to different things, and that's a whole different level of study that I have not, at this point, been released to get into. What I mean get into, I'm aware of these things. I've not studied them like I've studied what I teach you guys, okay? Maybe one day he'll tell me to do it. At the moment, he says, teach them what they need to know that will affect their walk. Understanding, you know, Jeremiah 4 and Zechariah 14 and all that other stuff is not going to affect your walk. It'll answer a question you may be curious about. What's going to affect your walk is knowing that what happened happened because of a thinking problem. That can affect your walk. And so everything that I teach, he's given me at this point, has to be about affecting. You can take what I taught today and use it today. Figuring out the Zen time stuff doesn't necessarily mean anything you could do with it ever. <laughs> it's going to happen the way it's going to happen, and figuring it out isn't going to make any difference. What you need to figure out is what causes it. What causes it is wrong thinking. And so let's work on that, because thinking is the problem. All right, next question. All right, from William. Uh, will you be talking about helping us decide what our motives behind our thoughts, uh, our thought life is? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not planning to do anything specifically to deal with that directly, but I'm sure it'll come up indirectly in many places. But motive is really something that you work out through counsel. See, in the counseling process, the discipleship process and counseling process, the person who's mentoring you and counseling you helps you to see what's driving you. Because you have a hard time seeing it. Others see it in you much more easily than you can see it in yourself. That's where you need good counsel from friends. You know, if you have a really good friend who can be open and honest with you, or a mentor, counselor person like myself, somebody like that who can work with you, who knows you well enough, who can help you walk through. Now, a person who, a person who knows you really well can see it themselves. A person like me who doesn't know you so well, maybe, but I can ask you enough questions that can help dig out what's driving you. Because I know how to do that. That's part of my training. But I don't know that I'm going to really have that in here so much, but um, I'll write that down. So the, the question was dealing with, dealing with the uh, motive behind the... Yes, what are the motives behind our thought life? Okay, well, let me just correct that real quickly. It's not the motive behind the thoughts. It's the motive is what determines what you do with the thoughts. Did that make sense? All right, the thoughts are just randomly going to pop up or they're going to pop up because of what's happening and, you know, you're going through a situation and something in you generates a thought relating to what just happened. Oh, I got this idea. I can do this or I shouldn't do that or what if I did this? Now, your motive, the driver, the yetzer, the motive that drives behind it, the urge, the desire is going to determine what you do with the thought. Okay? But there's no motive behind the thought. The motive comes after the thought. Now, let's say you have an initial thought, and that thought sparks something inside you that you have a strong desire about. 
Well, that may generate additional thoughts as you try to come up with a plan and process to achieve the desire, which could be good. Okay, you may have a desire to start a business. You may have a desire to do some benevolence somewhere or to do something to, to make something beautiful like art or a garden or something. And then thoughts will come to coalesce around that desire to make the desire manifest. Remember, thoughts and desire lead to manifesting something. But that also can come along the way of how someone ends up in adultery. Okay, thought, hmm, she's pretty, he looks good. More thoughts, because I like the idea. Hmm, I wonder how I can get their attention. How I can, you see, thoughts can then, the desire sparks more thoughts, not the initial thought. It's the driver behind, eventually, the action. Did that make sense to everyone? Okay. Any more before we end? Is there a scripture that you would suggest uh, to use in morning prayer to fight off fleshly thoughts? I mean, I would take some of these verses that would motivate you about the fact that he knows what you're thinking. I would, you know, look at the verses that talk about how you need to let his mind be in you and say, okay, but I'm going to plan my day to let this mind be in me. You know, how would Yeshua, constantly ask yourself, you know, what would Yeshua think of this? How would he be thinking at this time? Because a lot of, you know, we used to have that WWJ, the, the, the bracelets, what would Jesus do bracelets? And I, I did a teaching called What Would Yeshua Would Do? Well, the thing is, not, uh, actually it was what did Yeshua would do. It's not so much what would he do, but how would he think, which eventually would lead to what he would do. What would his mindset be in the situation? Would he, would he stay where you are or would he leave? Would he get more involved or would he get less involved? Would he, what, what would his thinking process be like? What do you think, what do you think his thinking process would be like? based on what you know of him. Of course, if you don't know him, you just know a little bit about him, you wouldn't be able to answer that question anyway. You'd have to know him to know how he would think. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay, from uh, Stephen Craig. He says that uh, you said Solomon built the temple for Yahweh to dwell with humans. Is this a type of Yeshua Messiah coming to create a people and a place on earth for the Father to dwell with man, men for eternity. Well, I'm, I'm not really sure about the whole wording of all that, but just simply, you know, David really wanted a place, a nice building, instead of just a shabby old tent. That's the way he saw it. He saw it as a shabby old tent. He wanted a nice building for Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh allowed David to have that desire and allowed Solomon to build it. It wasn't really Yahweh's need. He didn't need a big building, a fancy thing. Um, and, and so, but it's all a metaphor, as I talked about in the Follow the Pattern teaching, that building the temple and building the, ta the tabernacle of the wilderness is all done according to a pattern that we are to build ourselves as, a, as that dwelling place for him. So, I mean, whatever was just said on the live stream, I would have to say generally I agreed with what it was trying to say. So, Kind of going back to the point you were making about the what scriptures you might be able to pray over or to think about in the morning, um, Psalm 119 came to mind. Um, I know it talks a lot about loving the law and how wonderful it is in our lives, and I know it's been really helpful for me, mm -hmm. um, and I use it in my prayers, so I just thought I would share that. That's good. That's good. I mean, look, you, you, only you know what motivates you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Only you know what motivates you. Um, I was thinking mostly about verses that had to do with thoughts. So if you're having a problem with your thoughts, you may want to read some of the verses that we quoted here that have to do with your thoughts. But if it has to do with a certain approach to something like the, the Torah, Psalm 119 is about as good as it gets for the right mindset or thought approach about Torah. You can't get really better than what King David said there. Okay. I would, I would have to agree with you uh, 100%. Uh, Wayne, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, add to um, everything that we were talking about. It just made, made me uh, bring me back to uh, Genesis with uh, Noah. And uh, it says that, uh, but Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. And uh, Noah was righteous man, perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with Elohim. So... 
that always brought me back of he walked, he was in perfect connection with Elohim, perfect, uh, uh, just how you explained it earlier, and I always see it like that, and we always want to look for that favor and be righteous, so I just wanted to add that, like that's a perfect uh, description that we want to look for in that. Amen. Now, you are jumping ahead to part three of this teaching probably, but what was the problem before, before Noah was called righteous? It says that every inclination of the thoughts of man's heart was on evil continually. So we're going to cover that verse either next week or the week after. No, no, jumping ahead's okay. You get a little preview. But you, you, you didn't cover that part of the verse, which is like a, just a few verses earlier, because it's in 6.8 when Noah finds favor, but it's in 6.5 in Genesis where it says that, you know, man's, the thoughts of his heart are on evil continuously. And so the whole flood came, why? Wrong thinking. <laughs> Wrong thinking led to wrong action, wrong to wrong, led to wrong habits and destinies, and the whole thing, the planet got messed up. Guess what? We're in a planet now that's not thinking very good. A lot of wrong thinking going on in the planet. So we're ending up in a place that's going to be just like another flood. The whole thing's going to have to get wiped out. It's sad, but true. Microphone is where now? Okay, Dawid, go ahead. Um... Christine brought it out uh, about other different uh, scriptures and uh, that brought to mind the scripture I had thought about when you had uh, were trying to come up with scriptures for morning and such like that. One of the ones that speaks to me is, and it's all over this teaching, is be not deceived. Elohim is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. Okay, so take what Dawid said and just add that the sowing starts with the thought. Okay, so if you're going to understand reaping and sowing is a law that cannot be broken, that that's a motivator as to why you want to deal with your thoughts, because your thoughts are the beginning process of the sowing that leads to the reaping. All right? Yeah, I was just thinking along the lines of um, blessing and cursing, and that is in Proverbs everywhere. You know, if you... If you um, look at everything you go into, is this going to, you ask yourself, yourself, is this going to bring blessing or is it going to bring cursing? It can keep you from those things too. That's what I, um, I remember growing up with my dad, he would teach, he would always told us, you know, read Proverbs every day. There's one for each day and just fix your mind on thinking the way he wants us to think and it will keep you from sin because you're thinking wisely. You're thinking his wisdom rather than your own. Right. Only in 31-day months, though. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so, so understand with all of this, okay, understand with all of this is that the, um, the human being, most, most personality styles of human beings, most of us generally... Don't do things with a result in mind. We're not thinking about what we're hoping to accomplish or what result. Because I see people get all upset at times. I'm like, well, you did this, this, and this. What did you think was going to happen? <laughs> see, did you actually even think about what the result was going to be? Why do you act surprised when you went from here to here and it led to here? That's where it goes. Well, because when I was doing this and this, I never was really thinking about where it goes. But every time you take a step, you're stepping in a direction. Did you ever wonder where, you know, is there a cliff in front of you? Is there, you know, is there a pit in front of you? What is, what is there going, where are you headed? And so if we could be more results driven, in other words, thinking about if I do this, what does that result in? What does that ultimately lead? What does it accomplish? What does it yield? What kind of fruit? Most of us are reactive instead of proactive. We spend most of our life just reacting to things, responding to things, instead of making choices proactively so that things happen in a way that we actually intend instead of just being reacting to other stuff that's already happening. And so we're not doing things intentionally. 
We're doing things in response of what we're responding to situations instead of stopping and going, okay, here's the situation. Let me now choose to proactively take it in a direction instead of just responding. So hopefully that makes sense. This is the toughest thing, dealing with this, you know, however many pound thing above our shoulders, you know? What goes on between those ears, that's the toughest part. All these things that happen is because of a lot of wrong thinking. Disconnected thinking, skewed thinking, perverted thinking, whatever, just, you know, delusional thinking, <laughs> just whatever word you want to put in there that's a negative. I mean, we just have a lot of that kind of stuff going on. All right, is that it? All right, it looks like you're going to do it. Go get the children, please. One, two, three. Shabbat shalom. Shavuot tov. Shavuot tov.